Good morning, everyone. Um, thanks for joining. So this is part two of uh, MEC's Lunch and Learn Rehabilitation Series. So the first series um, presented by Lauren Ager. And Lauren is actually right next to me today, uh, which is an excellent, excellent resource um, for more information and a great deal of knowledge um, sits with more Lauren in this space as well. Um, so, yeah, thanks a lot for everyone coming along. I know there's a lot of experts in the room as well today. So um, feel free to post questions as we go. I'll try to answer them towards the end. Um, if we're out of time or it's a bit of a curly question I need to get more information on, um, I can follow up on those or post the presentation. Feel free to email through any questions as well. So happy to take those on and respond. All right, let's share screen, get this underway. Coming through. All right, excellent. So part two of the rehabilitation series, MEC Morning. So just as you've signed up for the webinar, that's exactly what you've seen there. So just a quick recap, um, mainly around design and construction rehabilit rehabilitation of mine sites. Um, so a bit more detail really around the rehabilitation outcomes through the landform optimization um, is, is where most of this is. So, but you know, feel free questions. It's a very, very broad topic. Um, so I understand it's hard to cover in an, in an hour long session. Uh, but we'll do the best to get through and answer questions you might have. So a quick run through of the agenda. Um, I think most people here know a fair bit about MEC mining. Um, so just a quick overview and then a run through from mine rehabilitation. I'm um, sharing the wrong, wrong screen. Sorry, sorry team. Okay, that's better. Sorry about that. Um, so quick overview, MEC mining, uh, overview of mine rehabilitation, a quick touch on the post mining land use, which is a tie back to a lot of what the previous uh, session, part one of this rehabilitation um, series was about. So a lot of that being, I guess, drummed up by new legislation changes in Queensland and in other states around Australia. Uh, and then through to the end, uh, design and planning for mine closure. So that's where most of the, I guess, the meat of the content will sit in this one. And then a touch on some key challenges for actually designing and executing rehabilitation. So a quick overview of MEC. Um, got links there for the website and the LinkedIn page to give you great information around our capability statements and uh, work that we've conducted in the past. Uh, essentially, they covered everything mining. So open cut coal, open bit metals, underground coal and metals. Um, we've got an excellent expanding geotech space at the moment and a whole bunch of other exciting things coming on currently. So uh, expanding business, expanding technical expertise, um, doing a lot of really exciting work. Um, so excellent place to go. Um, Offices in Brisbane and Perth as well. So both sides of the country um, covered off. So a quick overview of mine rehabilitation, um, just a, basically a recap, um, very brief look at it. Uh, there's a whole bunch of different definitions from different reports and different, different takes on things, but essentially most of it centers around just reversing the impacts of mining, um, getting things back to a sustainable state. Um, ideally equivalent or better uh, to what it was pre-mining. So that's kind of where most of that sits. You can see in the image there, just a very, uh, a very basic life cycle of a mine from planning through to relinquishment. Um, you can see in there just the smaller boxes, um, call outs of progressive rehabilitation and care and maintenance. So care and maintenance there being a little bit of a, a controversial um, piece really. And that is a lot of the new legislation is actually specifically targeted to, I guess, reduce reduce operators um, drawing that out or taking the Mickey environmentally essentially in that care and maintenance space. So 
So to touch on rehabilitation objectives, these will be broad and wide depending on what they are. They're going to be very case specific. Um, but overall, they're there to give clarity of the plan targets and deliverables of executing the rehabilitation plan. So they'll set the direction of what you need to achieve and the things that will be in common for everywhere as requirements. Uh, the first three there that everyone will be quite familiar with, uh, safe, stable and non-polluting. Uh, and the fourth one there being that they're actually achieving an in alignment with the post mining land use, the PMLU, uh, and also the non-use management areas, which are uh, areas that are essentially non-rehabilitated um, that need quite a lot of a justification to get them over the line, or at least on paper, need a lot of justification to get approval uh, to be classed as the NUMAs. Um, so just touching on these quickly, so a safe state for the general public. So that's covering off on things. Voids are non-accessible if they're steep drop-offs. Um, there aren't going to be failures or rock falls around where people have access to. Um, there's no, I guess, dangerous material or gases or anything like that from the mine. Uh, the physically and chemically stable, so not expecting to have reactive material interacting with the surrounding environment. And pollution, very similar like to that, not polluting surrounding waterways, um, not leaching heavy metals into surrounding soils, um, those kind of things that are detrimental to the surrounding environment. And this last one, this post-mining land use, so really achieving that. So that's something that needs to be set out very clearly. And a lot of the new legislation is trying to push that um, quite heavily to make sure that people know exactly what that, what the mining area will be used for and how it's going to be operated after mining is finished. Um, so that's they're one of the biggest, most important parts of actually the mine re rehabilitation because um, they'll set essentially where you need to get to falling right in that target, in that target space. Governing bodies around Australia. So this is more just a call out. One, it's, it's an information piece with links there um, to have a look at these government departments. Um, but it is just a call out as well. Similar with a lot of the safety legislation in mining, there's not a national um, standard or framework. It is managed by the state governments. Um, there's varying degrees throughout different states and territories of the implementation of uh, progressive rehabilitation and requirements for post mining land use. Um, they're all generally moving in the same direction to get basically to get a better outcome um, because we have in the past seen a lot of mines not rehabilitated well um, and many of them not actually handed back to that relinquishment stage, handed back to the government as a, you know, a functioning, nicely rehabilitated um, post mine. So that's where a lot of that, that's the idea of a lot of this legislation change is to get better outcomes. Um, and all the states do seem to be moving in the same direction, though at slightly different rates. And um, it is coming together though, generally. So to touch on the post mining land use, um, this is really a, a throwback to part one that Lauren presented excellently um, a few weeks ago. So these post-mining land uses are going to be the most important driver for determining your input design parameters when you're looking at your final landform designs. So the plan, the planned land use after mining, it'll drive your major requirements such as your gradients on your surfaces, um, surface drainage requirements, how you need to actually manage or deal with the uh, void backfill, so final voids uh, and even ramp voids. Material placement, so what material needs to go where, does material need to be contained, is some um, more suitable. Um, yeah, we need to maintain topsoil on the top so we can actually allow vegetation growth. Uh, another piece on this one as well is this maintained and non-maintained infrastructure and vegetation. So just some, some examples. Um, with in red, the typical points of difference to, to some other areas, just examples of some post mine uses highlighted. So grazing land. So generally, if you're looking at um, very common on the east, eastern Australia, so Queensland, New South Wales, as we'll see on the next slide, um, but lower slope gradients, you know, if you're trying to run cattle on there. Um, example right here, New Ackland. So the New Ackland pastoral um, managed to have a very successful example of um, grazing as a post mining. Land use, so uh, post mining there as well, they're actually getting uh, better, I guess, bee fields out of the 
out of the cattle uh, than they did with all the records pre-mining. So that's been a very good example of returning that and actually improving. Uh, native ecosystem, so specific vegetation actually planted rather than letting um, weeds and especially noxious weeds actually take over the area. Uh, conservation land, so state forests, national parks, agriculture and cropping. Um, so yeah, more of a focus on the, on the soil in that case. Uh, water storage and or management. So potentially in very arid environments, um, there's a couple of spots in, in uh, central Queensland looking at this currently where there's actually, a, I guess, a risk to, to water supply and dry seasons, um, potential to actually use post mining voids as water storage options for agriculture. Uh, recreation, so you know, water sports, um, fishing, if you've got the right water quality and it supports it. Uh, landfill, industrial and energy production. So this is another one that's, uh, I guess, getting a bit more popular in recent times, the solar and the wind farms um, added to mining or post-mining areas. So a quick snapshot as a look at coal mines in eastern Australia, so Queensland and New South Wales. Um, we've seen from there that the post-mining land use, agriculture and biodiversity, there's actually from the, from the sites looked at, uh, in this particular study, so there's about 120 odd, um, nearly all of them actually ended up with at least one, one area on the site uh, as an agriculture or biodiversity. So 98% of them, in fact, um, from this study were had included agriculture or biodiversity as a post mining land use. Um, over on the western side of the country, a little bit different, you'll see that as well. Um, a lot of the final landforms, a lot more mirroring to the surrounding mesas and things, so much higher angles um, for you know fitting in with the natural landscape um, and different use over there. So jumping into this design and planning for my enclosure, so a bit of an overview um, and a little bit more detail around some of the work that MEC does and is continuing to do. So an overview of the closure design. So one big call out point here, and it's a, it's a common theme through everything, through the um, key issues and things to watch out for as well, is actually that the design and the planning for my enclosure is completed as early as possible, but then is also incorporated into the, into the ongoing mine planning processes. So captured in the long and the midterm planning all the way through to the, to the short term as plans change. So the big drivers for this really is you can make you can make correct decisions at the right time um, based on so social, environmental, economic, operational decisions that need to be made. Um, they can be made with the right inputs, right information to them. Um, next big one is really the downstream designs and execution planning. So when you get through all the way through to your short term plans, that the right information is there for these plans to actually align with the overall closure design and planning. Um, and the big one there, the third big point, is really that it's available at the right time, the information. So different planning horizons and different teams actually working on different things to produce information. Um, you need to have that communication there and that information available. So this is just a quick image to the left, um, just showing the key elements of closure planning uh, from the ICWM. So kind of cyclical, as a process, um, but also noted in that publication as well, it's not necessarily going to be sequential. So as more information comes to light, as plans change, as information inputs change, um, you'd need to step back and revisit components of this as you would with any other component of a mine plan. So MEC Mining's involvement in closure planning. So MEC Mining's been heavily involved over the past five years. Um, for multiple clients and multiple sites. So fairly, fairly broad spectrum on it. So from independent estimator for um, Earthworks rates inputs, because um, at the end of the day, the financial assurance calculators and the actual cost of all these activities are extremely important for uh, mining companies and, and contractors to get a handle of. Um, we've done a lot of work uh, in recent times, especially for progressive rehabilitation and closure planning submissions. So getting all of the mine planning components together, um, maps, details, schedules, and everything that is actually required under that submission framework. 
uh, one that we've done for uh, fairly consistently, uh, mainly in the last three to four years, is a lot of the landform optimization. So uh, optimize for the rehabilitation, closure, um, and cost minimization to actually get to the standard that it needs to be. Um, and following on from that, the actual equipment allocation and scheduling for the rehabilitation. So a combination of methods, the most common ones there, we've got um, dozer bush being the most common for the um, bulk earthworks of, of reshaping uh, surface dumps, as an example, for, for bulk movement. Um, truck shovel, where rehandle or relocation is required to achieve the final landform. Um, even using drag lines, so especially around final voids um, and things like that, where there's a relatively short distance, but it may be a large or a deep drop that's not going to be safe or not going to be achievable for a, for a dozer push style operation, um, and the drag line is there and available. Uh, and then also some of the actually blasting final walls. So even uh, we have in the past who actually recommended additional stripping and additional mining um, to help pay for taking additional material to get back to an acceptable and a safe a safe wall angle essentially for the final pit void. Uh, some of the other parts of this as well which are extremely important is visualizations for the community consultation. So we've done work uh, for a couple of sites actually where there's been just private uh, private landholder has still actually owned part of the mining lease. Um, part of the land there and there's there's some fairly uh, I guess it's fairly important especially in that case for the the consultation of that all those individuals um, who are very close who actually will be um, individually personally impacted if something is not up to standard that they're happy with so it might be something to do with the, they might be running livestock in a specific area near a uh, near a water course or, or cropping that needs to be specific to an area um, that they will will need it to be done to the standard that they're happy with in that you know, specific area. So this stuff here is very important because it, it will also help actually flag issues that um, the operators may not have um, realised in the first place. Um, and this last one in here too is just detailed estimates for mine rehabilitation. So around quantities for one, but also costs. Um, cost, very important because some of this, depending on how it's done, as we'll see, we'll see a quick case study later, um, you can actually have an, an extremely large variation in cost depending on how this is actually completed. So that's a massive point for us as well. Uh, we've been able to save or, you know, reduce the cost of executing a re rehabilitation significantly by using the, utilising the correct equipment and the right schedule for it um, for a number of clients. So fairly rough overview, but uh, general overview of the MEC process for final landform design. Um, so you can see down the left-hand side there, the, the large, I guess, the major steps we've got down there from generating a start surface. So um, realising that if you've got design data or design uh, designs in place that haven't actually been completed yet, that they'll need to be added into your start surface. So um, accurate surface for where you're starting from, otherwise your outputs are going to be, well, they're going to be the same level of accuracy as your inputs, essentially. Um, so that is actually a very important step. Um, some of this too, if it's happening from a, a start of a, you know, in a, in a pre-fees sort of a level, if there's no, if there's no uh, actual information for a large section or the entire mine, um, a whole bunch of assumptions and things to put in place need to be fairly accurate to actually get this correct. Uh, input parameters. So a lot of this, as we said earlier, will actually be, you'll, you'll formulate these from your intended post-mining land use. So a lot of the gradients, target RLs, um, where you want your drainage to go, the extents and exclusion areas of rehab. So, um, you know, if existing areas are going to be already a well-established um, ecosystem, something like that, you don't want to touch it, um, that's fine. Exclude that, make sure that's um, known by everyone involved. So reshaping iterations, um, largely driven by input parameters. So uh, a lot of the work that we've done, um, really driven by the gradients of areas, um, water modelling and other design surfaces as, as target or maximum or minimum levels. Um, with the main difficult part of this is getting all that right and getting the cut fill balance correct. Um, and we have 
especially in the last five years, um, software available has been improving rapidly. We've got some excellent options for that to get that cut fill balance right for a smooth landform. Uh, down through your detailed adjustments. So a lot of the a lot of the detailed design around water modeling and drainage, um, we'll generally add that in. We'll generally run our iterations on the reshaping and incorporate water modeling in the in the rough models um, to then inform our detailed design work for that. So the drainage lines, um, any of the rock line channels and things that we need based on our where where water's modeled to go, um, where it's going to I guess pool and, and run to and where we need it to go. From there, so um, basically when we're happy with the surface, we go through and generate our cut fill solids um, from our start surface and landform surface. Uh, and then we're down into the scheduling and process allocation. So creating vectors, and I'll, I'll show some images of this um, shortly, but just creating our vectors for where material can move from and to, um, allocating based on that and also the material characterization. Uh, allocating what process we're actually going to use to move material, um, as well as with other constraints. So from that allocation, um, we'll build a schedule, and then depending on on software and and modelling use, we'll either do an integrated uh, excavation slash material movement and haulage schedule, or we'll run a schedule and then do a post process haulage model, and. The final outcome generally will be that we put all of this through a cost model. Um, so I have a schedule and cost model to give to the client. And it should be a fairly, um, it's all of that together is a fairly useful, I guess, combination of data for people to actually go and start getting ready to execute plans. So the major components of closure design, um, we've just got the, the key areas really to support those objectives of the safe, stable, non-polluting landform design that supports the planned um, post-mining land uses. So we can see there an image on the right, uh, some work we did a few years ago for a site in Queensland uh, was a, a huge area that's um, part of the area that was uh, designed up for this particular client. So these key areas we've got in here, so the final landform design, which is what you can see there on the right in the image, uh, material characterization. So any of your more common, more common in the metals mines to, in terms of quantity, uh, like acid forming materials, um, but still, still quite common over this side of the country, sodic soils and um, issues with salinity um, and, and other, I guess more so in the older mines, um, actually not having enough topsoil or material that's suitable for, to support the required vegetation for, at the end of the mine life. Uh, material placement, so, heavily based on the characterization and the landform design, what needs to go where and how much of it needs to go where. Uh, the water management, so surface drainage and then interaction with any floodplains and existing natural water courses, and then options around storage in voids and also water quality in voids. Uh, the maintained and non-maintained infrastructure, so generally it's either to let people in, keep people out, or control water. That's going to be a fair portion of the infrastructure that's left behind. And then one that I'm not going to talk about too much today, um, but vegetation selection as well. So extremely important. And generally you'll find in a lot of the longer term sort of thousand year plus erosion modeling for surface stability, the vegetation is, has an enormous impact on that, um, often more so than the actual gradient of a surface to a degree. So continuing on this final landform design, so it's got to be considered in all operational mine plans. And that ties back to the having the right information at the right time and actually updating these final landforms as things change in your operational plan. So you've got the information there. Um, we need to rely on, align to all the requirements of the selected post mining land uses. So gradients, minimum, maximum levels, uh, visual. So there's a lot of aesthetic things come into play as well. Uh, interaction with weather patterns, water tables, so where that's going to sit in relation to voids, um, floodplains for surface water, all that sort of, um, I guess, interaction with the local water and water courses. Um, any standoffs you need in place from other environments or infrastructure, 
um, surface void and void drainage, um, restriction allowance of access. So a lot of that's around uh, the safe aspect for people, um, but also other native fauna. Uh, and then the maintain, non-maintain infrastructure. So balance cut and fill volumes, that's a big one. Um, if it's not balanced, essentially, you'll go to execute a design and it won't work. You'll either have too much material there or you won't have enough and you'll end up with a chunky, non-smooth uh, landform that's not going to be suitable for what the intention is. Uh, bulk material allocation. So same thing again, that characterization um, and the actual placement of the bulk material. And another focus on that surface water management. So just an example, um, some design outputs from this style of work. So this is this is actually just a dummy data set. The topography is real and the the uh, the waste dump designs and pit void are a representative of a essentially a, a strip mine. Um, so based on a you know a very basic strip mine in central Queensland. Um, so we can see here allocation through our actual dozer vectors. Um, we've got our very basic in this case, but we've got a sequence there and we've got our final surface um, that we actually need to achieve as our design. So that can go through to obviously updates. You can see these dumps are extremely clean, um, which we'll, we'll touch on that a little bit later too as one of our key issues. Um, but obviously when everything's actually designed from the first place to the right final gradients and lines up, um, Number one, it's very easy to actually get your final surface that you want to achieve. And number two, it's a lot cheaper um, because you're not moving material great distances uh, for where it needs to go. So that's exactly what we can see here from this particular uh, dummy design set of data. You can see most of this material, there was a little bit required from, from truck shovel to deal with this final void in this case. Uh, but most of the material in this case, because the design aligns with the final gradients. Uh, the dozer push vectors are generally quite short. Um, you can see that from the cost on the cost estimation. So um, based on the dozer vectors we've generated for this cut fill balance to, to get to this final landform, um, just in conjunction with our MEC mining dozer push calculator, we've got our cost estimation for the dozer operations there. So most of it is quite down. It's in the, in the green sort of a turquoise area of that cost. Um, so it's only when you've got to move material long distances and need to start excavating and hauling, um, that's when the cost is significantly blows out. Um, and an example of that on the next slide here. So what we've seen, we've seen this in a number of sites, um, essentially, I'll just pick my pointer. Essentially when the final void is designed without the overall required angles, um, taken into account, which is quite common because people are trying to generally, for a cost reduction, you're trying to load up the front of a the front of an advancing dump um, because it is significantly cheaper to haul it there at the time. Um, in this example here, um, just with a gradient run, two different options here. So the final void uh, having allowance of a maximum 45 degree, so that's the dark blue in this case, and then an alternative option where the final void needs to be down to a maximum of 20 degrees. You can see over that entire area, there's actually a 58% increase in required cut volume to achieve that final landform. So what you'll often see as well, if something like that has changed, um, and a very dirty word for enviros, but often if you have to come back and claim more material to actually fill in to get to a final void, this section under progressive rehab rehabilitation, it is often done, it's done all through New South Wales and central Queensland, that is often already completed. If you need to come through and cut this, often you'll have to re-strip vegetation topsoil off that area, um, known as, as dehab, I guess, colloquially. Um, but yeah, terrible, very expensive. Um, you're ripping out established rehab to go and get to your final void. So just a, a big example of why this needs to be captured through and basically incorporated into mine planning um, because these final voids are they're enormous, uh, makes a, a massive difference to the volumetric movement at the end of mine life. So we've got here just some common treatment of the final voids. Um, so backfill to water table plus X metres, 
um, very common in metals pits where they're not strip mining and the pit's not getting progressively filled in as the mine progresses. You're getting to an essentially a, a large void at the end of mine. Um, and that's really just to control the interaction with the groundwater. Uh, backfill to pre-mining level. So that's getting a bit more traction and a bit more pressure under these new, um, I guess, the new frameworks for rehabilitation that have come through. That is extremely expensive if it's not planned for well, but also in general, um, if you've got a large hole there, it's going to be expensive to, to backfill that to pre-mining level. Um, generally only going to be a huge push for that if the site uh, is interacting directly with a floodplain or something like that where it can have a significant impact on the uh, on the quality of water surrounding the area. Uh, Reprofile faces to a shallower gradient, so that's going to be more common, um, just something that's stable. So similar to what we've shown down here um, for these final voids where they're not fully filled in, but they're they're actually dropped down to a, a you know a long-term geotechnically and erosionally stable surface. Uh, and last one on here for common is actually just flooding the voids with water for water storage or recreation or you know ar uh, irrigation for agriculture. Going through the material characterization, so this is really about how the material is going to behave physically and chemically when it's placed in its final location, and that's for a, a long-term assessment. So call out there too, with the rest of mine plan and, and all mine planning, um, the interpretation of how this material is expected to behave should be updated as new information comes to light uh, or as there are any changes to planning and execution. So just a table here, just for some, I guess, some common, common properties of material that require some sort of a treatment or management um, that a lot of you probably will have encountered um, on mines or working adjacent to any sort of mining. So first one there, fairly clear, but just low geotechnical stability. So low cohesion friction, um, angular repose. So common issues with that one, dump failures and erosion. So, excuse me, uh, common treatments for this, we've got material that's actually contained by more stable material, such as uh, if you've seen mud cells uh, or even, you know, weaker sands or, uh, I guess more homogeneous fine materials actually encapsulated by stable material. Uh, often this material, we won't place it um, in the toe of dumps. So especially in if you've got a very high dump in a metalliferous pit, for example, or a drag line mine, you won't want tertiary weak material in the toe. Um, just as a, as a general same principle, um, same goes for the final landforms. That's a stability issue. Uh, mixed and co-disposed with more stable material. So that's a good one too, even normal progressing dumps. Um, things like mud or rejects co-disposal over a, over a large tip head is a, is a fairly effective way to manage that in many environments. Uh, the other big ones here, erosion actually controlled with appropriate vegetative cover, um, which is a massive, massive for erosion is the vegetation. Um, same thing with if you've got set drainage channels or natural drainage channels that need to be maintained, armor rock, geofabrics, um, other material mixing, excellent ways to deal with that. Um, some of your other chemical properties, so um, low or high pH. So big ones, I'm sure everyone's aware of acid mine drainage is a massive issue um, and waterway pollution. So general treatments for those sort of materials. So you'll hear people call them paths and um, so potentially acid forming and acid forming materials um, are very common, especially in your you know, your iron ores and your gold mines. Um, so often that will need to be capped by inert material. Um, there are options for your high and low pH to treat with um, lime if you've lime if you've got acidic material or sulfur additives if you've got alkaline material, um, such as a limestone. Um, and separation is maintained from water sources. That's a big one because that's where you'll get issues. Um, from that material is actually the reaction when it's exposed to water. Uh, sodic soils and saline soils. So a uh, big one there for the sodic soils is the clay dispersion, um, which leads to that increased erosion or erodibility. Um, there are a few options there, remediation um, with gypsum for topsoil. Um, 
If it's a soil you need to use as topsoil, um, remediation is going to be fairly important for that. Outside of that, um, options to treat similar to the, uh, the I guess, non-pH neutral materials. Um, salinity, same sort of a thing. So you can cap the material. Um, there are options as well, depending on the environment and what vegetation requirements there are to actually select, um, I guess, highly salt tolerant vegetation that will grow on there and will stabilise. Um, the other one too is mixing with rock in blocking material uh, with the view then that over a, a long period of time, you'll actually get back to a, a more natural level um, of the salinity in the soil. So generally when you see high, high saline soils, it's due to changes in drainage patterns, which may be due to mining activities or things that have happened. Um, more commonly here, it's, it's due to irrigation over long periods of time. So agricultural activities. Uh, one call out on here as well, so I've touched on it before, is as more of an older mine problem. Um, and it definitely is in central Queensland, an older mine problem is the actual quantity of topsoil available. So where you don't have enough topsoil, there are, and I'll call out too that these are generally very expensive, um, but there are options there for actually ameliorating the soil um, to get other surrounding soil to get it to a point I guess an, an increased quality where it will support the vegetation that you need. So there's there's a number of organisations that um, produce hydromulch seeding and add-ins um, for that exact reason. Material placement. So following on from the characterisation, uh, we did touch on this before. So capping um, geotech stability to manage the pH, um, any, I guess, any pot potentially reactive material um, placement of the actual material is going to be the most effective management, the most practically executable management technique. Um, so just an example here recently um, of an underground metals mine in Western Australia we did some work for. So um, geotechnical assessment, uh, actually encapsulating some lower strength material in the dump for any long term. Uh, so that also serves a double purpose um, during construction it maintains stability of the dump. Uh, and in the final profiling, uh, reshaping of the dump as well, it actually allows this material to be the surface capping of the final surface as well. Um, so a double-edged saw there. And that's that's very common in metal mines in, in Western Australia and around the world um, to actually to have to cap that material with a, a significant, um, I guess a significant portion of the material in a, on the outside. Water management, so again, massive topic within itself. Um, the main call outs for this though, control and reduction of surface erosion, um, salinity as we touched on before, sustainability of vegetation, maintaining your natural water, waterways and your water supply for agriculture and in some cases consumption, um, if it goes, ends up going through to a dam or, or local water treatment. And that was one of the cases uh, we'd looked at um, previously uh, for a site we did some work for was there's actually pressure from the regional council um, to maintain a water storage to to actually assist with the agriculture in the region. Um, there was more agriculture and there wasn't any more water coming in. So it um, can be very, I guess, very helpful to local communities if that's the case. Um, some of these other major call outs, preventing contam contamination and preventing impact of floodplains and flow on impacts to surrounding areas. So especially if this can divert floodwaters or, or change something to impact either um, a natural ecosystem or also a town where it's going to impact people. So big important part of this is really to have a solid understanding of what you've got pre-mining um, to serve as a baseline because that will give you what metrics. Um, so whole bunch of things to actually monitor and des well, design for and then monitor. So things like your natural rate of surface erosion um, in areas, the uptake and health of your vegetation um, that's there previously, surface and groundwater quality, um, so chemical and particulate, and then water levels and flow velocities in streams as well as your groundwater levels. This is some big call outs there. Um, and it is a fairly sensitive thing 
well, depending on the area, but it can be extremely sensitive. Um, small changes can actually have very, very large impacts to the outcomes. Infrastructure, so this is one we've done some work on as well. Um, a lot of the work that we've done really has been, in terms of the infrastructure, has been uh, around sites that are close to rivers or floodplains. Um, so quite common, uh, in, especially in, in central Queensland uh, and New South Wales as well, uh, but is to actually have levees around rivers. And some of them are there during the mining operation. Um, the view is then on closure that the, the levees need to be able to stand there permanently and last for the next you know, 10,000 years as a setup. So um, again, same setup, safe, sustainable, non-polluting landform. So yeah, again, commonly around water, um, but the first few we've got on here are actually around keeping people safe. So if it's a, any sort of a recreational use um, as, as part of it or one of the areas, um, often there's roadways, fencing barriers and signage. So if there's a drop off void, uh, as an example, you need to have that fenced off or at least some sort of a barrier so people can't fall in and injure themselves. Uh, commonly anywhere around water, there's pumps and pipe work, which is obviously heavily maintained infrastructure. Um, energy production, as I touched on earlier, getting a bit more common, so solar and wind farms especially. Um, engineered drains, um, so you can see this image on the right, um, exactly there with some baffles to actually control flow velocities, um, things like that where you've got, you've got a concrete drain in place, place to divert water and control erosion. Um, levee banks, as I touched on, so they're quite common in Queensland, um, definitely in Queensland, some in New South Wales, uh, and then boat ramps, things for recreation. So a bit of a mix of maintained, non-maintained there. Um, essentially, it has to be sustainable um, as long as there's, I guess, everything in place to make it sustainable and make it safe, um, that'll satisfy the, the handover conditions. This one too, this is a massive topic, tailing storage facilities. And I won't profess that it's a, an area where I have high level expertise in at all. Um, and I think there are some tailings experts uh, in the room right now as well. So just a very, I guess a very quick overview of the tailing storage, um, as with everything going to be case by case. But essentially the, the reality is it's same objectives as the rest of mine closure. Um, it's just that there's a few more specific uh, objectives so you really want a landform that requires minimal to, to no maintenance at all. Um, it'll essentially look after itself after closure. Um, a big focus on stability to manage erosion, um, especially if you've got capped material and you don't want that coming to the surface or being released to surface. Uh, ensuring that tailings are contained and unable to escape to the environment. So it comes back to the capping and erosion as well. And then ensuring that your seepage is actually contained so to not impact on any other groundwater or surface water systems. Um, so the big, I guess the big easy wins on these for as a very, very generalized case. Um, but some of the, I mean, some of these objectives really can be managed, first of all, by designing the tailing storage facilities with closure in mind. So same as from day one, designing any of the dumps on a surface or pits. Um, thinking about closure, adhering to a, a closure plan, that's exactly the same point there. So ready to actually easily move back to a, you know, whatever the lower stable angle is, ready to put vegetation on. Uh, another point here too as a, as a big management piece is to actually develop a site-specific tailing storage facility decommissioning plan with clear objectives and review that regularly. So common th themes through all of this, review regularly. Uh, Introduce inert capping material. Um, that's a fairly, fairly common. That probably happens in most cases, I would imagine. Um, shallow, well vegetated slope. So again, mainly around that erosion control. Uh, same thing with vegetation. And then, if required, um, insulation, insulation of engineered drainage channels and, and spillways. So uh, spillway being, you know, if you're in a high rainfall area, especially. You may want, instead of getting washouts in walls and things, to actually have a dedicated spillway that's been engineered and will need to be maintained. 
So running from that, we'll jump into, I guess, the, the key challenges, um, things that we've dealt with in here and things that other sites um, around Australia and the world have, have dealt with or deal with on a, on a regular basis. So big hitters for it, uh, final landform design timing. So as we've spoken about before, design as early as possible to ensure that production plans align to it uh, and that changes to the final landform design need to be incorporated into mine plans as early as possible. So that's a big call out um, just because it's, I guess it, it could be done, it could be done better. It's um, generally that design update thing, it's, it's not given the same, I guess, level of credence that the rest of the mine planning is. In, in some cases it is, but in most cases, in, in my own personal experience, it hasn't been given that same level of credence to date. And that's something that's changing. Uh, Overdumping. So that's obviously extremely common. It causes a whole bunch of issues in, in short-term planning through to medium-term planning. Um, but it is a common one that it gets discovered when it's too late. Um, so survey control, um, just those standard standard good practice for um, your reconciliation processes. So we can see down here just a, just as a very quick example, but an overdumped profile. You've got a couple of options. We've well, got a few options. You can rehandle material out um, with a digger and haul it out with trucks um, to actually get back to where you need to be to material balance. Um, but you may actually have to lift your entire profile or introduce a section of a steeper section in your profile to actually maintain your cut fill balance and get to a, a reasonable surface. Um, so both of these options really, I mean, the, the lifted profile, all of your does are pushed vectors to actually achieve that are going to be longer. Um, and same thing here, you've got, I guess, a, a less favorable outcome. You've got a steeper section um, potentially non-compliant with, with what you've committed to in, in an EIS or in your um, PRCP. Just continue on with these challenges. So significant plan and or input changes. So big ones here and, and ones that aren't, aren't overly uncommon. So elective change to a pit design. So you'll get potentially in a metals pit, for example, you'll get more drilling. Um, you wanna expand a pit, you wanna make a pushback bigger. Uh, you want to go deeper. The other side of that as well is technology increases. So you might start a mine and you're still digging the same pit 20 years later. Suddenly, all your costs have actually reduced through technology and things getting bigger. Excuse me, um, techniques getting better. So one that's, it's there's multiple mines in central Queensland as an example at the moment uh, where the mine owners have actually gone back, a seam that was deemed waste earlier in the mine life, they've actually gone back to rehandle dumps off the top and go down to a deeper seam. So that means obviously you've got more waste that's coming out of that area that needs to go somewhere. Um, if part, ports of partial, <laughs> excuse me, if areas around that have been partially rehabilitated, that's going to be back in that dehab category, which is not what we want. It's expensive. It's it's moving in the wrong direction um, for that progressive rehabilitation. Um, so that's a big point there that you actually change the plan. You need that process in as a trigger. Um, it'll flow through your other planning processes generally because they're a bit more, I guess, rigorous and well established on all levels of the plan from the short, medium, long term. Um, it often doesn't trigger changes to that plan or it, or it triggers it, you know, six months later down the line. Um, Elective changes to landform final gradient. So this is an example here, and we've seen this at a couple of sites um, around Australia as well. There's actually a demonstrated trial on site. So a site may have committed to, as an example, a 15% slope, um, have actually gone and run a trial of a 20% slope in an area, and it's been successful, fully vegetated over a five-year period. Um, and then there's actually applications and updates to plans to change the rest of the requirement to that increased gradient, as an example, with the big driver for that being that it's it's cheaper from the haulage perspective, um, or you know a, a spoil fit perspective, it may be in that case. Um, so that's a big one there. That happens. Um, it'll need to have the designs updated to reflect that. Uh, one that can get caught uh, or catch people out, I guess, is incorrect material swell or compaction assumptions. So. In my experience, generally, people are more on the conservative side 
um, with the swell and compaction, um, but it's an easy one to get caught out. It's Generally, it's going to be less of an issue if you're on the conservative side, um, because you will, in most cases, you'll end up actually just being able to achieve a, you know, a lower angle for a cut fill balance. Um, if you're on the aggressive side and your material actually doesn't compact to where you think it is, that's when you'll be potentially cause issues, um, not actually be able to achieve within the limits of what you've committed to the final landform. Um, so something, again, captured through reconciliation processes. Uh, changes in process allocation this is a big one as well. So um, where you've got something that's flagged in a schedule as excavator waste, for example, and it's reallocated to a dozer or a drag line, um, essentially a process that has less optionality or selectivity of where that material is actually going to be placed in the dump. Um, that's a big change for, I guess, where what that final as-built dump is going to look like for the rehabilitation. Um, and just this big, the red call-out point here is that changes to the production plan are often not carried through to closure planning. And a lot of that's due to the, the planning horizons and the team separation. So segueing, I guess, that down to this knowledge gap in requirements. So one of the big parts here, and I've seen this definitely in my career as well, is a kind of a, a gap in communication of what's actually been committed in an EIS and what's committed in the um, progressive rehabilitation closure plan. So things that are, I mean, for, for me, things that have been confusing often are maximum versus overall gradients on slopes. So very similar to an overall slope angle of a wall versus uh, versus uh, the individual face angle. So things will get designed at a, you know, you've committed to a 15% slope, the whole dump gets designed based on 15% and there's no allowance for flat, slot, flat, flat sections for drainage banking or anything of that nature. Um, so this big call out here, commitments, initial designs and final designs are commonly managed by separate teams that are geographically separated. Um, so that communication is a key piece of this. It's no different to any other parts of the plan. Uh, it's just that it's, it can catch you out in a big way, uh, but it's not done effectively. Uh, equipment scheduling. So this is a common one as well. It seems to be becoming less and less common that there's actually dedicated equipment to complete mine closure activities. Um, I guess in the past there have been, in my, in my experience anyway, there's, there's been more, I guess, contractors engaged in the past as a specific activity for topsoiling and for, you know, recontouring of areas. It seems to have been in as part of, you know, going through a couple of, of, of low commodity price cycles. Um, a bit more cut out and often it's just production equipment that's pulled off path or used when available, um, which doesn't, it's it's difficult to schedule um, to actually get things done on a time frame. Um, based on, I guess, more community pressures and things, it's done probably a lot better in, in New South Wales currently than it is in Queensland, um, mainly based on the pressure due to proximity of communities. Um, there's a couple of other options there, you know, opportune scheduling of equipment when you can't use things. Uh, for, you know, if there's a, a dig is parked on a major shutdown or there's wet weather, excellent opportunity to go and um, utilise, you know, dozers to start pushing down a dump to actually get ahead. Um, so this one here, again, same call out, closure and operational planning conducted in isolation in a lot of cases um, and they're captured at different planning horizons. So one might be done weekly, monthly, the other one might be done twice a year or, or less. Uh, and the other, the last call out on key challenges are these creation of high erosion zones. So especially in strip mining, straight lines and sharp edges, um, they're a lot, they align better to the mine planning. You're moving rectangles essentially um, and you've got nice straight dumps. You've got a lower risk of dump trucks essentially driving or having dumps collapse under them where you've got a straight face and they're dumping, um, you know, they're lined up straight along a straight face. Um, a lot more common in metals mines, especially in, in WA, to have uh, nice smooth uh, smooth dump designs in there for that exact reason, to reduce that erosion overall. Um, this last one as well, uh, a lot of strip mines as well running permanent coal ramps in there. So concave depressions where you get partially filled ramp voids, so push down to a, you know, a 25% slope as a final on the edges. Um, 
these are always flagged as extremely high erosion zones. Um, so in terms of satisf satisfying the, the stability for a long-term uh, long modelling, a lot of the time these are not actually up to scratch. So that's the most, pretty much all of the content I've got there. Um, I've got some references on there for, for, I guess, things I've used and, and looked at in, in uh, conjunction with the work that MEC have done ourselves. Um, so yeah, these will be available in the presentation or linked in there. So, um, we'll jump forward if anyone's got any questions. Although we don't have a whole lot of time left. All right, so I'm getting a, uh, I'm getting a wrap up on this end. So what I'll do is I'll grab any questions there um, and we'll communicate this presentation out as well. I can send my email address through if anyone's got follow-up questions um, they'd like to ask. Um, but outside of that, thank you very much for coming, everybody. Um, really appreciate it. And I hope you got a lot out of the presentation.